So welcome to the third session of the ROAR annual meeting, Intro to the ROAR API. Um, I have sent uh, most of you, hopefully, who have registered. Um, if you registered late, you might not have gotten the email, but I have sent everyone some materials that I've also linked to in the chat. Uh, the primary two links that you'll want um, are the, the web page of the lesson that we'll be working through. And so I'm you know, going to be just scrolling through this web page and talking about things on it and giving you an opportunity to ask questions. And we'll have plenty of time for you to do exercises with the ROAR API and talk about um, what you uh, have discovered um, by doing those exercises and perhaps to share your exercises. So um, if you don't have those two links, um, please look in the ROAR chat, uh, in the chat for the Zoom to get those or just go to the website to see the lesson. Um, so I did wanna, uh, just a couple little housekeeping things. If you have a question while I'm talking, uh, I personally prefer it if you just unmute and ask it um, so that I don't have to, you know, so that you don't, uh, it doesn't linger in the chat or, um, you know, I don't, I'm not, I may not be looking at your your raised hand in your, uh, in your, um, avatar. So uh, feel free to just interrupt me at any time. Uh, but also in the notes doc, um, you can just list your questions. And if we don't have time to get to them in the session, um, we're going to stick around a little bit after this session, and we can always um, answer things uh, after that. So feel free to unmute, interrupt me at any time. Um, the other thing uh, that I wanted to say is that while I'm going through this, I encourage you to do the supposedly impossible task of multitasking. Um, feel free to sort of just go through this tutorial on your own, explore the War API documentation, try out some searches before we get to the official exercise parts of it, um, that will be fine. If I have something that I specifically want you to look at that I'm doing, I will warn you and ask you to uh, look at my screen, but feel free to just explore on your own as we do this. Um, so with that, um, I'll begin. So this is intro to the War API and I do wanna, um, make it clear that this is very much an introduction to the ROAR API. We're going to cover maybe about a third or even a little bit less of what the ROAR API is actually capable of during this lesson. So I'm happy to, um, you know, at a later date, um, produce uh, different tutorials that are sort of about more advanced searches and other parameters um, of the ROAR API. Um, so just, just so that you know, this is going to be a, a fairly general and introductory session. Um, we are, however, going to talk about elements of a ROAR record, at least go over in uh, um, at a high level what the metadata elements are in a ROAR record, because of course that's what you're trying to search when you're using the ROAR API. Um, so the main thing that we're going to be covering is constructing queries with the query parameter of the ROAR API. Now, um, as Anne and I were talking about briefly um, before we got officially started, um, I did want to mention the fact that we are currently in the process of um, collecting feedback on some very major proposed changes to the ROAR metadata schema. And that would entail some corresponding changes to the way the API works. Um, because of course, for instance, if we get rid of a metadata field, then you can no longer query it using the ROAR API, that kind of thing. Um, so I highly encourage you to go look at what we're proposing and give us feedback on that because we really would uh, would welcome that. Uh, but just to warn you that sort of what I'm going to teach you today will probably be good for, I would say about um, officially, this version of the API um, will continue to persist for at least uh, another year after we release version two. And we're looking at releasing version two in probably Q4 of 2023. Um, so, once we do have that new version, we can redo this kind of uh, teaching about the ROAR API, but just to warn you that that's coming. Um, so I'm assuming here that you know in general what an API is, that you're familiar with JSON data. Um, there are plenty of resources if you want a little brush up on that. Uh, but here are some links that we're going to be exploring during the tutorial. So you can go ahead and open those in different tabs in your browser, and we'll just be working with those. So I'm also gonna assume that because you're here at an Intro to Roar API session that you're pretty convinced 
of why Roar is or might be valuable for you. Uh, but in case you need to convince somebody else or teach somebody else about it, I have put some uh, material in here about why using the Roar API might be valuable for you. And the basic answer is to disambiguate organizational text strings. That's one of the key uh, value propositions of Roar. So you can see here in this GIF, this is a search for um, some scholarly content by affiliation, meaning which organization um, is the researcher affiliated with, one or more of the researchers. And you can see that when you put in different text strings for the same organization, it's returning different results. Um, if you spell Krakow with two Ks, you get 23 results. If you put it in in Polish, you only get two. If you spell Krakow with two Cs, you also get 23 results, but I can tell you that they are a different set of results. Um, so you, what you want is to uh, lump all of those text strings together um, using a Roar ID. And one of the most common uses of the Roar API and specifically about the query parameter, which is what I'm talking about here, is to use it to power what we call a type ahead widget in a form, which some people call an autocomplete which means that, for instance, if a researcher is submitting a manuscript to a system and that system asks, hey, which organization are you affiliated with? Instead of simply typing in a text string, um, that system can offer suggestions um, based on what they're typing. And you can see that happening in some wonderful type ahead demos um, that Liz Kazarnich, our wonderful tech lead who is on the call has built. And um, you can see those here, and that link is in the document. And in fact, um, what I'm going to suggest that you do is go and uh, go and try this out. So I'm going to actually ask you to take uh, just a couple of minutes, and I think maybe even just one minute, um, go to this link to the type ahead demos and try some searches in there. I'm going to put one minute on my clock. And when that's over, we'll see uh, what you think. Eight seconds. Okay. Um, anybody notice anything? Find anything surprising? Find anything useful? Is it doing an or search, not an and? Yes. Correct, Liz? Um, essentially, yes. What what term did you put in? The one I was really seeing it with was Environmental Department Australia. Yes. Yeah, we're going to talk about. Um, yes, it is treat, um, treating each of those terms as separate parts of the query. So if you, we're going to talk later about um, when you want to surround things with quotation marks and when you don't, um, either in your application or just even in your search. So the the basic answer is yes, it's searching. It's an or search. Any other comments, questions? Uh, yeah. Um, so it looked like um, I guess I hadn't <laughs> tried it uh, before. It looked like it was. Um, only uh, looking at complete words uh, when I was trying it. I'm not sure. I didn't get any results when it was just a partial word. So I started with like, 
<laughs> Brooke, <laughs> B-R-O-O. That's okay. which, which partial word were you doing? And I, I encourage you, by the way, to, to put these searches in the document um, so that we can. Yeah, I mean, it should start matching as soon as you start typing characters. Yeah, it did. Yeah, I had to get, yeah. I think, at least three, maybe four letters. In yeah, it's, before it's it started three letters. Doing it. Uh, yeah. it will it won't search a single letter but um and it, yeah and it is true that if you just if you just search for you know well that happens to match something but if you if you just search for part of a word without adding for instance a fuzzy matcher then it won't you know return anything like har and if i just did a search for that then no but it will begin Uh, Steve Cunham here, just a short comment about ordering of results, yes. uh, which are, it seems a little odd. Um, if I put in Oxford, for example, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the first few four, five, five entries, no, four, the first three entries don't have Oxford in the title at all. So they're obviously searching on location or, or something else yeah. um, or, 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 or an alternative name. Um, the University of Oxford, which I would have thought you know, would have been at the top is about eight down. Um, there's a whole, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there just seems to be slightly strange. I mean, it obviously functions, but slightly strange the ordering, uh, right. as if the, you know, the relevance listing is, is a bit, is a bit. So strange. yeah, I, I, so I'll tell you how it works. Um, the ordering of results is really powered by Elasticsearch. Um, so if you, um, I think I. I can put the actual link to how Elasticsearch orders results. It is a relevance ranking, um, but it's Elasticsearch's relevance ranking. We haven't done any additional processing on it after this. So, you know, the more characters you type, the more likely you'll get a close match. But yes, we have had some comments that the ordering is a bit odd for some searches. So yeah, if you would uh, store that search in the doc, that would be something that we can explore later. Yeah, and I guess to explain a bit further what this is searching, uh, there it's the query parameter that is used in this type ahead, uh, which is one of our search options in the Roar API, searches a subsection of the, the Roar record, a little tiny nested document. It's not searching the entire record. What happens is that we take everything from all the name fields and stick them into one field in this small nested document and then all of the external identifiers and stick them into another field in this nested document. So essentially what you're searching when you are uh, searching on strings that aren't external identifiers is all of the name related fields concatenated together. So name, aliases, labels, and acronyms. They're not, because we stripped that, uh, stripped out those separate field names basically all of the names have you know similar weight so what's happening in the case where you get something that is unexpected at the top is probably another record has more uh aliases acronyms or labels that repeat the same word or a similar word that are uh causing those to appear higher up in the results Um, I'm finding that old names of universities that have changed don't appear in the searches, and I, I don't think they're, I don't know that they're saved necessarily in the metadata, so that could be why. Yeah, I think yeah if, if it's not in the metadata, then obviously we can't return it in the search results, so that typically is the case if you can't find a particular name. Um, so that would be a case for potentially making a curation request to add that name to the aliases. Um, field yes, of indeed. a given record. Yeah, yeah I haven't um, put this link in the document, but that would be a great thing. We we actually do want to capture former names. That would be great. Yeah, feel free to request that. And, and when you say former names, how far back do you mean? Uh, <clears throat> so the answer, hey, sorry, this is Adam Butcher, curation like Roar. The answer to that question kind of depends on the extent to which the organization has persisted um, via, through the name change. So. If it's just like a, a university organization literally just changed their name from one thing to another, but otherwise um, kind of continued operations, then we would just index it as an um, alias field. Um, the kind of primary litmus test is whether affiliation usage exists under that form. So if you can search and find affiliation usage under that form, 
and again, the organization has persisted through the name change, then we'll almost always index it on the record. If there's a case where an organization actually used to be a different organization or part of something else and then became something else, then we would actually have to add that as a new record, which we can now do for inactive records um, and create a relationship to the new organization. But that, that might one, be one distinction to keep in mind. Um, you don't really have to worry about that too much. Um, in submitting requests, we would prefer that it just kind of come in and then obviously I can do an investigation to, to determine which case that is. Um, but yeah, just um, just submit it to us if you know something like that and we'll look at uh, getting it out of the registry. Okay, those were good questions and comments, some of which we'll address later on and some of which are good for us to, to know about. Um, so yeah, let's move on a little bit. Here's some um, general features of the ROAR API. Um, and this link is one that you may want to explore a lot. These are you know, sort of the full documentation for the War API. Um, it's a REST API, returns JSON data, entirely free to use, no authentication tokens, a um, little bit of a rate limit, um, powered by Django and Elasticsearch. Um, you can check to see if it's up by sending a query um, to our heartbeat checker. And then one of the things um, that's sort of key to know is that when we talk about using the War API, which we are doing right now, um, you need not, uh, the War API is not the only way to access War data at all. Um, so many people who I think of as sort of data analysts um, like to get the War data dump. And, you know, if you just want to like, you know, sort of analyze War data, you can get the War data dump, but you can, can also use the War data dump for querying, um, you know, from a system. Uh, and then we also store the raw data dump um, on both Zenodo and GitHub, so you can get it from either of those places. And in fact, you need not query the raw API live. You can install the entire API locally so that you don't have to worry about whether we whether you have uptime. If you want to submit um, a large number of requests, um, in fact, um, we really um, strongly encourage you to either use the data dump or in install the War API locally or both. We'd really kind of have to do both if you're installing it locally. Um, so we have great uptime on the Roar API, but you need not do only live querying of the Roar API. Um, and then also I did want to mention that if you are planning to use the Roar API, we strongly encourage you to sign up for the Roar Technical Forum uh, because we send announcements about forthcoming changes and requests for feedback and so on. There. So it's key to know that if you are, in fact, using the War API. Okay. So from there, I want to give you just a sense of um, what metadata is in Roar and go over this fairly quickly. Um, of course, you are probably familiar with the Roar identifier, which looks like this. Um, and then here are some of the basic um, information that you get in a Roar record. What type of organization is it? What are these other names, right? Um, What's the website? What's the location? What are the other identifiers? And again, as we'll go over um, more uh, a little bit later, um, that query search, which includes the search interface um, when you go to war.org um, slash search, is really only looking at the name related fields and the identifier fields. It's not looking at location. It's not looking at the website. Um, so that's a key thing to know. Um, if you want to look for a single Roar ID using the Roar API, um, that would be in this format. So obviously our website is at roar.org. The API is at api.roar.org. And one key thing to know is that you do need to add organizations to the end of that. If you only go to api.roar.org, that's not really where you can do the searching. You have to go to API war.org slash organizations. You can see here um, that there are 103,000, over 103,000 results. Um, this is showing you all of the active organizations in war, and we'll talk about organizational statuses in a bit. Um, but this is the basic place where in a browser or in a, a curl command or something like that, this is the basic place where the war API lives. Um, so what metadata um, can you go through? We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but maybe first, um, uh, let's take literally again, um, 30 seconds, I think, not even an entire minute, and just look for some more organizations. You probably have already done that or have been doing that, um, but take a little look at um, the search interface and uh, the API in a browser. And again, I, I did want to mention that this search interface 
uses the query parameter of the Roar API. So there's no difference between what you're searching for here and what you can get from the Roar API. It's just a different interface. OK, 30 seconds. Look for some things here. Five more seconds. Okay. Any interesting searches? Any interesting results? Comments? Questions? Okay. Let's talk about the raw data structure. So there are currently 16 top-level elements in a raw record. And as I mentioned, we are looking into um, changing that potentially. And these fall into cer certain categories, name fields, location fields, other kinds of information about the organization, uh, related organizations, external identifiers, and then a few fields that are deprecated and in 99.9 .9 of the cases, empty. Um, so let's, we can look at these a bit more closely. Um, one of the key things that I uh, wanted to mention were, was the status, the organization status. Um, so um, there are three allowed values in the status field, active, inactive, and withdrawn. And we did a lot of work on that um, this last year. Um, the query searches will only return active records by default. So that you saw, you know, when we were first looking at the Roar API, you get about 103 plus organization, 103,000 plus organizations, but those are only active organizations. Um, if you want to additionally retrieve inactive organizations, which means organizations that no longer exist, um, we can do that and I'll show you how to do that. And if you want withdrawn in Roar tends to mean mistaken records, you know, records that were added to Roar by mistake. So that's a kind of a key field to know. Um, the definitions here um, and the policies are also available in the Roar documentation. Um, so if you go to this link, you can read more about not only what these fields mean, but what they contain and how we decide what they contain. Um, so this is useful to, to get to know. Um, so let's get into using the Roar API. As I mentioned, there are three different parameters and we're really only covering the query parameter today. Query is designed for quick searches of an organization's name. Um, it's a fast and responsive query and it's really assuming that what you're putting in is either a name or an acronym um, or set the name in some language or also an external identifier. Uh, and that's why it only indexes those name and acronym fields and the external identifier fields. Advanced query, uh, using the advanced query, you can search through any field in a raw record as opposed to just the name fields or just the identifier fields. Um, so we have a lot of documentation about that. You can do a lot of sort of sophisticated analysis with those searches, but we're not really gonna go over that today. And then if you are interested in the affiliation parameter, I highly suggest that you come to our noon session um, where we're gonna talk about that. So this is a parameter that's uh, really not assuming that you're just searching for an organization name or an identifier. It's assuming that you have some of this, you know, sort of cluttered legacy data um, that has a lot of extraneous information that you don't need. That it isn't just the organization name, but it might be the department and the address, um, all kinds of, you know, punctuation that might mess up the search and that kind of thing. So the affiliation parameter really is meant to suggest possible matches more than to, um, you know, do a, a, a fast and easy search on just fairly clean organization name data. Um, 
We're going to very shortly be doing some exercises with the Roar API, uh, but here are some first general tips. Um, when you're searching the Roar API using an API query or a curl command at the terminal, um, the characters must be URL encoded. So um, I've got a link here to a URL encoder. So specifically for, you know, if you have an A with an accent aigu or something like that, um, you really should URL encode that before you pass it to the API. Um, special characters, um, there's an entire list here of what these special characters are. Um, also called reserved characters are characters that are operators in Elasticsearch. So um, I've got some examples later where, you know, some organization names have ampersands in them or slashes or, or, or that kind of thing. And you need to escape those if you're going to search them and get good results. Search strings with spaces do tend to, as somebody noticed earlier when playing with the type ahead, um, you know, you'll get the best results if you surround those with quotation marks, because otherwise it's going to essentially search every single word that you put in as separate parts of a query. Um, API searches return only the first 20 results by default, but you can page through them. And then you can filter the queries by three, um, three facets, country, uh, organization type, and as I talked about a little earlier, status, active records, inactive records, withdrawn records. Um, you can actually do some um, fuzzy matching and, and so on with uh, the query parameter, but you might want to save that for using the uh, advanced search instead. Okay, so here now, uh, which probably, um, which we've mentioned several times already, um, the query parameter, um, which runs the raw search and which runs the type ahead demo and which runs a lot of type aheads does only search the name related fields and kind of, as Liz mentioned, squishes them all into one, uh, as well as external identifiers. So you can search for any anything that is in one of these fields using the query parameter. So if I, um, oh, and the, the organizational search at data site commons um, also works this way, um, which is fun to do. So if you do a search for Oberlin using our search UI, you'll get four results. Um, one of which is Oberlin College, which has this as its website. But if you do a search for that website using the query parameter of the Roar API, you'll get zero results. And that is because that field is not indexed by this parameter. So that's key to know. Um, I'm going to go through just a few of these demonstrations and then ask you to do some of your own queries. Um, here is a very simple search. It's a single word. It's a very unique word. And there happens to be only one result in the Roar registry um, that has the word Mikiewicz in it. Uh, Mikiewicz was a very famous Polish poet, and he has several universities in Poland named after him. And here is the Adam Mikiewicz University in Poznan. So that's a very simple search, and you'll notice the syntax here, api.roar.org slash organizations, question mark, query equals Mikiewicz. Um, here is one of those um, beasts of a search that has some of these reserved characters in Elasticsearch. So what I've done is encode these. I've encoded this ampersand and this slash um, so that um, they're searching for the M and then percent five C is the ampersand. Uh, and then I, you know, I can't even read it. So <laughs> if, you, you, if you URL encode those, you will get the correct answer and no weird results. Uh, from that. Uh, and then if you try it without escaping the characters, you can see that how that works. Um, I always think that this is fun to do the same search with and without quotation marks. So here, if you search for Harvard University Press, you're getting um, over 11,000 results. If you surround it with quotation marks, boom, you get the single correct answer, correct result. Um, so I'll let you um, play with these a little bit more. Here's an organization acronym. The acronyms field is indexed by this query. Um, so uh, it's you know treating that not as a partial text, but um, a lot of a lot of things are matching acronyms sometimes. So that's always fun to do. Non-Latin characters, paging through results. And then um, let's talk a little bit about searching by identifier. 
Um, so the three most common external identifiers in rural records are grid IDs, which no longer really resolve to anything, uh, but we do have them, Wikidata IDs, uh, and ISNIs. And then there are quite a few that have um, funder registry IDs as well. Here, um, we have searched for a particular organization with a particular grid ID, and we have come back with the correct result. Um, you can see that this is, in fact, uh, the grid ID for this organization. But it is really key when you're searching for external identifiers, especially grid, to surround that with quotation marks, because if you only search for grid without quotation marks, there are a number of organizations that have grid in the name or even in the acronym, um, especially the Genetic Research Institute of the Desert, uh, who, who goes by the acronym GRID. And so unless you surround those with quotation marks, you're likely to get um, things with GRID in the name and uh, things in the acronym field um, more than you want to. So with that, I'm going to turn you loose. Um, let's try five minutes on practicing this kind of, uh, constructing this, these kinds of queries with the uh, ROAR API. Um, try a couple of these exercises, go through some of the demos, make up your own searches. And again, I'd be happy to see some of those um, with and without comments in the, in the notes document. Okay, five minutes. And we'll go on to filtering. Amanda, I have a quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is not, really not related to the API, I don't think, but it's, mm -hmm. I only get a giant blob of unreadable content when I go to those query pages. And you have this lovely option to look at <laughs> JSON. And I, I don't, you know, I would it's love to It's probably the to browser that you're using. Which browser are you using, Amy? Chrome. Um, I thought it was not, I think there are ways to, and what, um, what kind of um, computer do you have? JSON, a uh, Mac, JSON, pretty print crown. Thank you, Maria. I'll, I will look for that. I'm, sh I would love that for other reasons too. Anyway, I don't want to, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll stop talking so that people can actually think. No, no, no. That's a very good <laughs> question. Actually. I did forget to kind of account for that. Um, yeah, I think you, yeah. I, I often switch to Firefox when, uh, uh, doing this type of thing. Cause it looks nice. This is what I get in my Chrome, but I think I might have.
Hi, Amanda, this is Mushkin. Um, uh, I have a question on three fields, actually. It's um, not level one, level two, and level three. Is this only for the European country? I see it only for some of the records, and it's not for all of the records when I, I search in the API. I entirely do not know the answer to this question. Um, <laughs> so perhaps Adam or Liz, yeah. it's, all yeah, I know Liz is it's some kind of geographical thing. Yeah, we are, we are both uh, extremely familiar. Um, there were a handful, I don't know how many records originally had NUPS data, Adam, that were inherited from GRID, some, we'll say. It was sporadic, uh, not consistent or complete and not kept up to date. Right. Um, so in our update process, we basically have not been curating the the nuts data. So in new records, those fields will not be populated in any record that has had an update that data will be stripped out if it exists. It's um, on the uh, in the scheme of version two proposal for being eliminated from the addresses section. Um, as far as we know, it's not really being being used and it's maintained by G in GeoNames data. So it's not really our data exactly to maintain. It's something that users who want to could retrieve using the GeoNames ID that's in every record. Right, right. Makes sense. All right. Thank you. Let's take about another 45 seconds. And thanks to those of you who are putting comments and screenshots and questions in the notes doc. Okay. Comments, questions, observations. Um, we had some questions with actually the um, the previous exercise in the docs. Uh, one of which was, um, is there a piece of metadata that is just the ID string rather than the URL? And the answer is essentially no, um, because we consider the raw identifier to be the entire URL rather than just the unique part after the raw.org um, domain. But you can strip out the HTTPS. You know, yeah, URL. I will say that if you search for a specific raw identifier, we do handle that specially, both in the the user interface search and the uh, in the um, the query parameter quick search, well, and the affiliation search too, where we check the the URL and check if it's a Roar ID that is either formatted as a full URL as just the exact Roar ID matching the um, the the regular expression for just the identifier portion, or if it's Roar.org slash the identifier portion, and then we return the exact match of that ID. This earlier in this this lesson, I, I gave this example, which is as you'll see, is looking up a single raw ID uh, using the API. And here, it will take either the entire domain, you know, the eight, including the protocol HTTPS, or you can strip out the HTTPS colon backslash backslash and just put raw.org, or you can just put the numer alphanumeric part of the raw identifier. Um, that will work with any of those. So yeah. Okay, let's go on to filtering. We're doing pretty well on time. Um, so those queries that you've been constructing and practicing with can be filtered. 
um, by status, by organization type, and by country. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, the status of organizations in ROAR and how you really are only gonna get active organizations by default. I will mention too that the ROAR data dump um, always includes records of all statuses. So that if you use that, um, you uh, should know that. Um, these are the types of organization, the current types um, that we support, education, healthcare, company, archive, nonprofit, government, facility, or other. Um, somebody had asked about those types earlier. Um, we can filter on those. And then you can filter on uh, uh, the country, either using the country name in just sort of a plain text um, fashion or using the country code. Um, this is how a filter looks. It's the general syntax of it. And you can combine any of these filters. So you can search for, for instance, um, nonprofits in Finland. Um, and then here is some, um, some advice about if you do want to retrieve records with all statuses, um, you can do that, um, or you can retrieve uh, records of only particular statuses. And the ROAR search interface um, does have a little um, filter that will allow you to choose all or withdrawn or inactive records as well. So here is um, a search on Let's show us all of the withdrawn records in ROAR. Uh, there's about 1,200 of them. And again, there are different reasons for why these um, are mistakes essentially in ROAR or things that are no longer in scope for ROAR, but you can at least filter on that. And if I do collapse all of these, you can always see, at least in Firefox, my lovely <laughs> JSON interface, um, you can see how many of these 1,200 results have a particular type or how many are in a particular country at least for the top, top results there. Um, you can filter on the rural registry to show only organizations in Qatar, if I pronounced that correctly, 112. Um, mostly companies, some educational organizations, some government organizations. Um, and you can search uh, on organizations in Qatar that include inactive and withdrawn records. Um, I want to show you this. Here is a very simple search on Wiley, uh, which produces four results, three of which are um, versions of John Wiley and Sons Publishing Company in different companies, and one of which is the fourth of which is actually an educational organization uh, in Texas, Wiley College. So you can filter only by uh, companies which returns three results, um, excluding the college in Texas. Um, you can search only for things, you know, with the term Wiley in Germany, which includes uh, John Wiley and Sons German headquarters, or you can combine those if you like. And you can always use the country code as well. Um, and here's another few of those. So um, let's take another five minutes and practice filtering by status, by organization type, by country code, by country name, and combining filters. One, one key thing about um, combining filters is that you do that with a comma, right? So take a look at this syntax here in order to combine filters. Okay, five minutes. Liz, Arthur had a question in the chat about case sensitivity for statuses. They're not case sensitive when you're doing a filter, are they? Um, no, uh, filters are generally not, filters are not case sensitive. They used to be, and no, they're not. Is that, that's true for searches too, right? They're case insensitive. 
like just regular queries without mm -hmm. filters? That I would have to look through the the code to check. I would not 100% say yes for sure on that. Okay. I'm adding that to the doc for future research. And I mean, I can say we don't transform it into lowercase. Um, Where are your definitions of what the types are and what, what do you mean by facility? You put that link in. Um, it's uh, I'll, I'll put that link in the chat. It's in the Roar documentation, uh, which is linked. I assumed it was somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it's actually on, on GitHub as well. So let's see here. Um, so here up in Roar data structure, if you click on this thing that says 16 top level elements, this is our documentation. And then if you scroll down, we have what we call definitions and policies. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Adam, for that link as well. About another minute. Oh, just to clarify on casing, so we don't take your entire search and convert it to lowercase, but the way that the Elasticsearch indexing is set up, the name fields, um, name, aliases, acronyms, we have a lowercase analyzer set up for those. So those don't, do get um, searched as case sensitive, but not all the fields in the entire record. So for example, URLs will not, um, we match exact case to URLs and country names and a few other things. Okay. Comments, questions, observations, complaints <laughs> about filtering. I made a note in the doc about the, the names of countries are not entirely obvious, maybe. Or... Yeah, like that's actually really interesting about the Czech Republic. 
Um, so I suppose that's not understood as a, it, I mean, that's nothing to do with, yeah, 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 I guess. In the country, the plain language country name for the Czech Republic is apparently Czechia, which I did not know. But yeah, country code is always going to be a little bit more specific because sure, I, I was actually wondering as I was talking about that, oh, what if you search for a country name in a different language? Like, what if I search for Deutschland instead of <laughs> Germany? <laughs> I don't know if it if it takes the plain, but the country code is always safe, right? No, because, it, we use the ISO 2 country names and codes, and we we aren't currently pulling, mapping those to the over to the um, various translations of those yeah. names. Let's see. Oh, I think um, that, that, this is an interesting um, one in the doc um, about a search with a, a status active returning an error. We can look at that specifically. Um, whoops, this is different. Oh, hang on. Let's see my to do list. Um, so this search here, this is returning an error. I think the syntax is a little wrong here. I don't think you put the comma here. Let me look at this for one sec. I think it would need to be um, and. Not a comma there. Uh, I have to sort of close read these. I'd have to go look at it. I think it might be constructed slightly wrong. So we don't need to put um, double quotation mark like um, on the filter? No. Um, country name might be an exception, but I think it would just be safer to use the country code. No, no, it, it, the no. filters will not work with um, with quotes because those are sad, those are um, static values in the. Uh, right. Thanks. Hey, Amanda, just a heads up. We're at five minutes. Great. Um. I still think I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to. Uh, I think maybe after the meeting, let me look at this um, this question about the order of the filter term. I still think there's something a little wrong about the syntax there, but I have to look at it super closely. Um, but yeah, all right. So just to, just to end up, um, and then hopefully we'll even have a few more minutes for questions, and then um, as I say, we can stay after um, the hour if you like. I did want to show you. Um, that there are some code examples of the Roar API in action. Uh, I actually maintain here um, a list. Uh, 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 we have here actually, now this is a, a Roar repository on GitHub uh, where we have some scripts that we've written and some that other people have contributed. Um, these are all Python scripts. Um, if you have any that you would like to contribute, um, you, there are instructions for contributing here as well as uh, good documentation about these scripts. And in particular, um, I wanted to show you um, this one, which is just a little Python script that does something a lot of people want to do, which is take a CSV list of identifiers, could be ISNI, could be GRID, um, and spit out um, a corresponding list of raw identifiers. So here's the actual code to do this. And um, if you are code literate, you can read this and see how it's using the raw API. Here is um, the API specified in the code uh, and so on. And then, you know, for instance, line 25, um, since we're searching for um, grid identifiers and we don't want to get the genetic research uh, Institute of the desert every time, uh, we do, the code surrounds that with quotation marks. So things like that are in there. So there's plenty of uh, code to look through in there. And then there is also this list of generic repositories on GitHub uh, that use Roar, usually the Roar API, but sometimes the Roar data dump. Um, so we have here uh, Open Alex, whom we're going to hear from uh, at noon. Uh, we have here Data Site, which we've looked at a lot, uh, a little bit. Um, the Allen uh, Institute for AI is also going to pre 
be presenting at noon and you can uh, browse through a lot of their code. And a lot of that does use um, the affiliation parameter of the Rory API, which we didn't go over, but that you know enables this kind of um, matching of messy text strings um, rather than sort of simple searches. We have some uh, resource links here. Um, what other comments, what other questions do you have before we wrap it up? Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, so last night I was playing around and I wrote a kind of a type ahead demo page um, that I configured to, you, you could either, either use the web API or use the local Docker API. Um, and I just had a couple of questions about that. I noticed that um, there, there is an option for the, uh, the, in the Docker compose file to just pull images rather than building because the build takes a long time to build the images. Um, but uh, it only, it, there are not um, ARM64 versions of the images. I was wondering if there were plans to provide those. Yeah, well, so there are not ARM64 versions of the Elasticsearch version that we're using, uh, um, which is something that I'm looking into. So we we do need to upgrade to a newer Elasticsearch slash OpenSearch uh, version, but we need to test it out first to make sure it, it doesn't work. Gotcha. My hope is that we'll just switch over the version and everything will be swimmingly great. Um, but oh, of course it will be. <laughs> <laughs> We're running version yeah. six point something of Elasticsearch. I can't remember six. Point, it's six point, point something, and it's up to so, version eight now. So it is. A yeah, and I number. think what was it? I know the eight X versions uh, support ARM, and I think the seven X versions might um, as well. So that is something that we're aware of and uh, looking into. Um, and the other question was that I had about that was. Um, uh, Strangely, I found um, hitting the Docker API to be significantly slower than actually hitting your web API, um, which is really unusual. If you, you know, if you use uh, Docker, that's not usually. Um, I, I don't know if anybody else has reported this. Yeah, so I actually use the local a local version of the API like all the time, and it's actually significantly faster normally for me um, when I'm huh. doing my queries. So I'm not sure what could be causing that. Um, although I kind of up, have very. I think this is Andrew yeah. speaking right now. Are you are you running like one of the newer Macs or the? I am. So it's it's possible that would be related yeah i've got a an m1 chip that i was running it on yeah it, i mean that could be why um i mostly use because of the old elastic search version i have an intel mac where i where i run everything um to kind of and it like i said the speed is thing so i'm guessing it's maybe it's, it's a related issue um so what you're experiencing with the arm elastic search stuff yeah that would make sense all right thank you Good questions. Uh, and someone has asked uh, whether the recording will be shared, and it will. And of course, um, this lesson is still here um, with all the links. I may be making a few changes to it based on uh, what we've gone through today. But um, but yes, we'll be here for a few more minutes. Thank you all so much for coming. And again, if you have not already registered for um, the session at noon, I highly um, encourage that. And then I did want to mention too that um, as you exit the meeting, you'll be asked, uh, you'll be given an evaluation. Um, so uh, we welcome your comments on the session. Thanks all.